Hey, in this one, I want to explain and then compare two approaches to dynamic dispatch that are used in Rust and C++. Each language has one of the approaches built in, and they made different choices about which one, and the other one can be handwritten. Well, actually, both can be handwritten in both languages. And speaking of which, before we jump into the fancy animations, let me show you something cool. All right, so here we are on Compiler Explorer, and I just have this trait, speak, with one method, speak. And I have cats and dogs implementing it, just a tried and true example. Uh, they're down here expressing their thoughts. And we can see over in the output, we have meow and woof. Um, so I want to try something kind of interesting here. I want to try sketching out a type that is kind of like a reference that can refer to anything that implements this speak trait. So it's going to be a concrete type with kind of a pointer or a reference inside that can either refer to a cat or a dog or any future implementer of speak. And in order to do this, I'm going to use a technique called type erasure that I first learned how to do in C++. And here's one way it can look in Rust, although I don't recommend that you write it this way, as we'll see soon. So I'm going to start by adding a struct, and I'm going to call it anything speak, because it's going to be able to refer to anything that is speak. And it's going to have a lifetime parameter because it's kind of a referency type. But the first thing I'm going to do is actually throw that lifetime parameter into a phantom data because I want to be bound by this lifetime parameter, but we're not actually going to be using a reference in here. We're going to be using a raw pointer because we're going to be pointing at something that we don't know what it is and doing some tricky pointer cast, and that's a little bit easier on a raw pointer. So speaking of which, our data is going to be a raw pointer, which is I'm using this tool non-null from the standard library, which is just a raw pointer that's known to not be null. And what type are we going to point at? Well, I don't know. I mean, that's the whole point of this thing is I don't know exactly what we're pointing at. I just know that it implements speak. So I'm going to represent that using unit. So next, we need a way to call speak on whatever we're pointing at. And we don't know how to call speak on what we're pointing at. We don't even know what we're pointing at. So one really good way to call into code that you don't know ahead of time is using a function pointer. So I'm going to add a function pointer here, and I'm going to call it speak thunk for reasons I'll explain soon. And this is going to be a function that is going to take in our data, so our non-null unit pointer, except that I'm also going to add unsafe. This is going to be an unsafe function pointer because the function that we store in here is going to have a very important precondition that the compiler is not going to be able to check for us, which is that the only thing we can pass into this function is this data pointer. We can't pass in any non-null unit. It must be this one because we're going to create this function pointer and this data pointer in a way that's very tightly coupled, which we'll see in a second. So I'm going to sketch out an impl block now for anything speak. And I'm going to write a new function. And this new function is very important because in this new function, we have a brief moment where we know how we are creating our anything speak value. So this is our one chance to write down any information that we need about the type that we're pointing to before that information vanishes and we forget exactly what we're pointing to. So our data pointer is just going to be our t cast into a unit pointer. Straightforward enough. Now what about our speak thunk? Well, we're going to use the convenient fact that closures can implicitly convert into function pointers when they don't capture anything. And remember, we're designing this so that our speak thunk takes the data pointer as a parameter. And what's it going to do with it? Well, inside this function that we're in right now, we know what data is pointing to. We know that it's actually pointing to a t. So we can just cast our data pointer to a t and then dereference it and then call speak on it. And now this operation is unsafe right here because we're dereferencing a raw pointer, but it's safe to do because we know we just stored a t inside of our data pointer and we know that we're only ever going to call the speak thunk using data. And by the way, let me now explain why I called this speak thunk. So thunk is kind of a strange term with lots of different uses, but it usually involves the idea of wrapping some code in a th like a thin wrapper function, either to delay evaluation or to do some light bookkeeping before or after running the real code. And that's basically what we're doing here, right? We essentially want to just call t's speak method directly, but we can't because all we have is our pointer to unit. So we have to wrap t's speak in a thunk that casts the pointer to an appropriate type before calling the real function. All right, so now let's try implementing speak for anything speak. So how's this going to work? Well, we have our speak thunk, and we have our pointer that we're supposed to pass into it. So all we have to do is call our speak thunk using our data pointer. So let's try using this now. I'm going to get rid of these just so we can see more clearly what's going on. And I'm going to create an anything speak that is pointing at a cat. So you see we have meow over here. Now I'm going to rebind that same value to a new anything speak that's pointing to a dog. And you see now we have meow and woof. 
So the same value of the same type is referring to two different implementers of speak and is calling their speak functions appropriately. So we just implemented type erasure in Rust. But before we move on, I want to point out one more thing about this code that I don't really like. And that's the fact that if we came along later and added another function to this trait, now we have to go down here and add another function pointer here. Suddenly we're gonna to have to store a function pointer for each and every method in this trait if we wanna be able to use it from an anything speak. So suddenly the size of our anything speak struct is linear in the number of methods in the trait. And that's bad news, especially if there are a lot of methods that aren't used very often or just like lots of methods in general. Think of like the iterator trait. And so I'm gonna get around that by adding another layer of indirection here. So instead of storing all of the function pointers in line right here, I'm gonna factor them out into a separate struct that just holds all the function pointers. And then inside of anything speak, we'll just point at that. And so that way our anything speak stays constant sized. So we can just copy it around and stuff and the table of functions stays behind a pointer. So I'm gonna add one more struct here and it's gonna be called speak functions. And I'll go ahead and move our speak thunk into it. And you know, to do add yell thunk. And now in here, we're just gonna have a pointer to this. Now, what type should we use for the pointer? Well, you might be tempted to reach for box or something, but I don't really like the idea of allocating and deallocating memory every time we create an anything speak. And also, it's kind of just unnecessary because every time I have an anything speak that's pointing at a dog, for example, they're all gonna have the same stuff inside of the speak function struct. So it would be nice if they could all share it somehow. So I'm gonna be a little bit audacious here and just say I'm gonna have a tick static reference to a speak functions. And if you're thinking, how the heck is this gonna work with the tick static lifetime, you're not alone. Let's see how it works. So down here, I'm not storing my speak thunk directly inside my struct anymore. It's gonna be inside of my function struct. So here we have speak functions, and this field is now inside of speak functions. And this is the wrong type, I need a reference. So why don't I just take a reference to this? And now this works. This is complaining about this. And there we go. There's our meow and woof. So if you've never seen this before, this should blow your mind a little bit. We just created this value right here and then claimed that it has static lifetime and took a reference to it. And the compiler agrees. The compiler is fine with this. And this blew my mind the first time I saw it. This is a feature called constant promotion, or sometimes I've heard it called R value static promotion, where if you have a value that's built up of things that are all known at compile time, so they're just constants, or in this case, like a closure that has no captures, None of these things depends on any runtime inputs. They're all available at compile time. So when we take a reference to it, the compiler sees that it doesn't need any runtime information to construct this value for us. And so it just says, sure, I'll stick that in static memory and I'll give you a reference to it that lives as long as you need it to, including for the rest of the lifetime of the program. But this lets us express exactly what we want, which is kind of a constant that's associated with each type. Think like a variable template from C++ that we can stick a pointer to in all of our anything speaks. And now our anything speaks are constant sized and we can add as many methods as we want to the speak trait and not worry about them blowing up. So I think this is a pretty straightforward, but also clever and interesting implementation of type erasure in Rust. But again, I do not recommend that you actually write this code in Rust. And the reason is that there's a much, much easier way to do it in Rust. So let's talk about that. So you may have noticed by now that while writing anything speak, we actually just implemented this type namely a reference to a speak trait object, which I'll just call dine speak for convenience. And I mean, literally, like a ref dine speak is essentially identical to our struct with two pointers in it. We used type erasure to forget exactly what type we were pointing to, just knowing that it implemented the speak trait. And we created a reference to it. And along with that reference, we wrote down information about how to use it that could be retrieved at runtime. This is exactly the same thing that the Rust compiler does for you when you create a value of type ref dine speak. A reference to a trait object in Rust is a wide pointer, which basically just means a pointer bundled with some additional information. In this case, the additional information is another pointer to a table of function pointers and other stuff that can be used to operate on our type erased value dynamically. This isn't the only type of wide pointer in Rust. You may know slices are also wide pointers where the extra data is the slice's length. But for our purposes today, when I say wide pointer, I'll just be referring to this kind. So not only are references to trait objects wide, but raw pointers are too including the raw pointers inside of non-null and box, making, for example, a box dine speak itself be a wide pointer with no additional interaction or anything, which I think is neat. But we've only talked about half the equation so far. The other half is our speak function struct, which is our table of function pointers, which the compiler must also generate for us so it can point wide pointers at it. 
This auto-generated struct is called a vtable, short for virtual method table, and it's quite similar to what we hand wrote with some slight but important differences. For one, notice that I mentioned box, which is an owning pointer, which needs to have a way to destroy the type erased value. To support that, the compiler also automatically gives the vtable a pointer to some code for running the values destructor, which includes the drop implementation, if any, along with the drop glue, which is the auto-generated stuff that recursively drops the values fields. It also puts the size and alignment in there for reasons. And in contrast to our vtable implementation, the compiler gets to remove a level of indirection. We had to wrap our calls into the trait methods in thunks so we could cast our type erase pointer to the correct type. But we only had to do that to play by the rules of the type system. Those pointer casts are no ops at the ABI level, and the compiler, because it's the compiler, can just skip them. So we've already sort of walked through how this works, but let's quickly see what happens when we use trade object wide pointers, the language feature, rather than our hand rolled version. So here's our speak trait, and implementing speak, we have an animal with some data in it just to make the visualization in a second make more sense. So when we create an animal and use it directly, nothing at all special or magic or dynamic happens. There are no V tables, no wide pointers. We're calling a method on an animal that is statically resolved. Only when we ask to use the speak trait dynamically does all this magic kick in. The way we ask to use speak dynamically is by performing what's called an unsizing cast or coercion into this dyn speak type. At the moment the compiler sees us do this, it creates a V table for animal and sticks it in static memory somewhere. Now, when I say the moment it sees us do this, I'm talking about at compile time. The V table is generated statically at compile time when the compiler sees code that needs it, but no sooner. It then sticks a pointer to that vtable in the wide pointer that we've named da here, and then this call to speak is resolved dynamically through the vtable. Visualizing what this looks like in memory, here's our animal, which is a 32-bit integer. When we perform our unsizing cast, we create this wide pointer, which points to our animal and our vtable, respectively. When we call speak using this wide pointer, we dereference the value and the virtual function separately. Note that there's no data dependency between the value and the vpointer. In other words, we could get the address of speak without necessarily dereferencing the value pointer. I don't have any numbers on this or anything, but I'll offer the observation that in the world of CPU pipelining and speculative execution, this structure might give your CPU the opportunity to do some really cool stuff about speeding up this call. So that's the built-in support that Rust provides for dynamic dispatch. Now I'd like to look at the built-in support that C++ provides for dynamic dispatch. To be clear, you can implement what we just saw in C++, but you have to handwrite it. When you ask the compiler to write dynamic dispatch for you, it gives you a different approach. Let's look at how it does this stuff. So unlike the type class-based polymorphism from Rust, C++ runtime polymorphism is more rooted in classical object-oriented class hierarchies. This class here, animal, has one member function, speak, but it's not runtime polymorphic yet. In order to make it runtime polymorphic, I have to mark it virtual. Note that I make this decision when I'm writing the class, not when I'm using it. There's no way to use a member function polymorphically that wasn't explicitly declared as runtime polymorphic. So the moment I declare a member function virtual in this class, that is when the compiler creates a vtable, and it sticks a hidden pointer to the vtable at the beginning of the data layout of the class. The vtable has some metadata in it. Here I'm showing some base class offset stuff and a pointer to RTTI, which is runtime type information that helps power a dynamic cast and stuff like that. And then a pointer to my speak virtual function. Notice that unlike in Rust, this vtable does not automatically have an entry for the destructor of animal. If you plan on destroying your object polymorphically, like if you want to destroy a unique pointer base that's really pointing to an object of type derived, you need to manually mark your destructor as virtual or else you get undefined behavior. It would be nice if this were automatic, but it's technically possible to use these features correctly without a virtual destructor, so C++ makes it opt-in. Also, now that we mentioned the destructor, we need to follow the rule of three here. I pretty much always just delete my copy operations for polymorphic types. Notice how I said polymorphic types there. We've truly baked polymorphism into the type itself rather than the usage of the type. As soon as I declare a function, I need to decide whether it's to be used polymorphically or not, and I can't change my decision without changing the definition of the class. This approach is intrusive in a big way. Let's see it visualized. So here's my class before I add a virtual function. When I add one, the compiler generates a vtable and inserts a pointer at the beginning of my class layout. Notice that in this case, because I just had an int before, that actually tripled the size and doubled the alignment of my class. And the larger alignment actually means the size was basically quadrupled, not tripled. 
That's a cost paid for every single instance of my class, whether it ends up being used polymorphically or not. Now, if I am going to use it polymorphically, that happens through a pointer or a reference. Here, I'll call speak on my pointer, and notice that unlike with wide pointers, there is a data dependency here, where I have to finish dereferencing the pointer to my object before I even have the vpointer. So at least on paper, I'm bottlenecked on fetching the code for the speak function until I have the object itself first. So this is how C++ does dynamic dispatch. And it does it this way for some valid reasons. For example, you could imagine the language doing some tricks like Rust, like using thin pointers for normal objects, but wide pointers for polymorphic types. But that doesn't work because C++ also supports pointers to incomplete types. And it would be impossible to know if a pointer to incomplete type should be thin or wide, since you don't know if the type is polymorphic or not. So C++ kind of has to implement dynamic dispatch how I've shown here using this intrusive vpointer approach. So to recap, let's make a chart thing with the two approaches we've seen. So first off, wide pointers are not intrusive, meaning you can add runtime polymorphism and new interfaces after the fact to a value that didn't necessarily agree ahead of time that it was going to be used polymorphically. The intrusive approach is, of course, intrusive, meaning if you want to add or remove runtime polymorphism or interfaces, you need to modify the original type. For the stack size of a pointer, wide pointers are double the size of regular pointers, whereas a pointer to an intrusive object is just a regular pointer wide. For indirections when calling a virtual function, there are two indirections with wide pointers. One jump to the vtable and then one jump from the vtable to the function with no data dependency on the value itself. Although in the likely case that you need it in the method, you will need to dereference that too. For this one, you have to jump to the actual object, then to the vtable, then from the vtable to the function. So that's three. For the memory overhead of the vpointer, for wide pointers, you only pay it on pointers that you are actually going to use dynamically although it is attached to each and every pointer. Whereas for the intrusive pointer, it's inside every object, whether that object will be used dynamically or not. So obviously my own opinion has been leaking through this entire time. And to no one's surprise, I personally feel that wide pointers are a more elegant solution to the problem of dynamic dispatch in general. But there are exceptions to every generalization. For example, here's a Rust result, which is using type erasure for its error type, which is common in application code. Because this Bockstein error is a wide pointer, the error variant of this result is two pointers wide. So that's two pointers this result type has to lug around in order to power the error path of our code, which is probably a path that's less likely to be taken. It would be nice if we could make sure our code is maximally optimized for the happy path instead. This is one benefit of switching to the anyhow crate and using its error type. It acts a lot like Bockstein error, but miraculously is only a thin pointer wide. So how does anyhow error do that? Well, internally, it holds this pointer to this type error impl. OK, well, what's that? Error impl is a value that lives out on the heap that's a struct consisting of a v pointer followed by some object data. This should look very familiar. Now, this v pointer points at this type error v table, which is a struct of function pointers, just as we'd expect. It starts with a pointer to drop, which should be no surprise. And then it has a number of other functions. But this overall structure is identical to the C++ intrusive v pointer approach. And it's a good choice for this use case because it optimizes the stack size of our error type under the assumption that if an error occurs, you're already on the cold path anyway. So it's fine to pay a little extra cost to get at the error itself. Now, what about the C++ world? Well, my impression is that the zeitgeist is moving or has moved away from liking this intrusive viewpointer approach and more toward wide pointers. For example, here are two types in the standard library that provide type erasure over different concepts. In the standard library shipped with the Clang compiler, std function from C++11 is implemented using inheritance and ordinary virtual functions behind the scenes, and consequently, dispatching uses an intrusive vpointer. But there's a newer, more experimental implementation that looks much more like wide pointers that you can opt into if you use this ABI flag. std any, on the other hand, is a much newer library component, and it was written using a wide pointer-esque approach in the first place. There's also an amazing library called Dino, written by Louis Dion, who is coincidentally one of the libc++ maintainers, that helps automate writing your own type erased objects using wide pointers. So my point is that code in both of these languages can benefit from both of these approaches to dynamic dispatch, and it's worth understanding them both so you can make the best decision for your code. Beyond that, I have more to say about this topic. I actually cut several minutes of this video out for the sake of time, and I might cut those into a follow-up video. But for now, I want to leave you with this quote from Sean Parent. And I'm going to link one of his talks in the description that really opened my eyes about this topic. Otherwise, I'd love to hear what you think about wide pointers versus intrusive v pointers in the comments. And I'll see you next time.